Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Podcast Daily. It is Wednesday, and we are rolling right along with our post-spring Ohio State coverage. Uh, that is Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham. I am Austin Ward. So uh, at OhioState.Rivals.com, Bill dove into his offensive depth chart. Now we're going to slice it up, pick it apart, or just agree with everything he wrote, probably. Um, but we can go through it. Uh, it's a post-spring projection, and Bill has done this for many years. How accurate do you say you normally are, uh, or how much carryover is there generally from your projections at the end of April into, let's say, an opening day lineup? Um, I think there's a decent amount of carryover. It's it's like fairly obvious some years, I, and especially this year on offense. Like, I guess as obvious as it can be without them having their starting quarterback officially named. Um, it does, it does feel kind of obvious as well. There have definitely been years where I've gone back and looked at my depth chart projections <laughs> in the spring and it's like, it's not even close, but, um, I think most of the time it's fairly accurate and what's helpful this year, especially is just like how much we've gotten to watch in the spring. So a lot of times you're like flying blind and just trying to guess based off stuff people have said. And then what you see in the spring game, we have the benefit of having seen like a third of the total spring practice. If you year, hadn't put Tate helpful. Marcel at quarterback all those years, then it would have been more accurate. Well, part of it is, uh, is manifesting, you know, you're not, you're not just saying what oh, you okay. think will happen. It's what you want to happen. And I yeah. want to take to be the no, quarterback. It didn't work out. Um, Berm. No. How about that? You should you should have meditated on that more than you did. <laughs> should he have? Is that what we're going with? <laughs> your 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 puns are normally yeah, better than well, that. There, there were other there were other ones I Let's could go, have played with. There do take two. Let's try a second to. one. <laughs> yeah. Work works workshop some. Uh, what were you going to ask? I can't me? remember now. Um, when you when you look at it, let's just start start with the quarterback spot. Uh, I think that we've covered this a good amount. Do you disagree at all with the way that Bill approached it? No, I mean, I think we all were pretty much in agreement on Monday's show that right now, Com Accord is the likely leader, but it doesn't mean that the battle is over. And I, I think that, you know, we are all at different um, points along that path, but I think we're all on the same path. It's just... I don't, uh, you know, Austin, I think you believe the gap is further than I think it is. And I probably think it's further than Bill thinks it is. So um, I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer for it because we're all entitled to our own opinion based on what we've seen and heard. But um, I, I think if you're at leaving spring and don't think that Kyle McCord has the lead, then you weren't paying attention um, or listening to anything anyone said now. But the question is, how much does that lead matter? And I don't think that that lead is um, insurmountable. I don't think that that lead is something that Devin Brown can't overcome. I don't think that lead is something that Kyle McCord can rest on his laurels and, and feel comfortable with. But I think it's still objective that he has a lead. I think it, into there was himself. an interesting part uh, that Bill had gone back to check and that CJ Stroud was officially named the starter on August 21st. Is that right, Bill, of that year, two years ago? That, yeah. Mm -hmm. That seems later to me than it than the reality. Like it, it did seem like C.J. Stroud was always going to be the quarterback for Ohio State. Um, but and we've mentioned this before that like Ryan Day's approach is to be patient. And I wonder, but how much patience this time he will have, knowing that you, you know, have a game on the road against a Big Ten opponent. Do you want to spend a week or two weeks or three weeks of training camp? Uh, still making it even as Ohio State did in the spring. Uh, that's, that's I guess, my main question now. How long will that actually continue before he wants to have a starter getting ready to go on the road and play a Big Ten opponent? I think my guess is that they will take it up to the first scrimmage in the fall, which I think is maybe like technically the second Saturday of camp, the way they've done it in the past. But it's like the seventh or eighth practice i think of of preseason camp is when they do that first saturday scrimmage um and then coming out of that i, I don't know if i guess if you don't have an idea I, I don't know what you do at that point but i think coming out of that they'll have a pretty good idea because i remember ryan day like he would never he wouldn't name cj the starter we all kind of assumed it was coming but like the week prior to actually saying cj is a starter he said cj is starting to separate so 
And that was like right before I think we were going out there to watch the day of practice where Big Ten Network is there. <laughs> so I guess he needed to prepare us for seeing CJ take all the first team reps. Um, but, and that very do, well may happen again this summer. Don't you think that that day is probably what ended up causing the, the announcement not to happen until later because CJ didn't participate that day and his shoulder was bothering him? And oh, yeah, some, he didn't throw the ball. There were some, yeah, there right. were some <laughs> questions about whether or not he was actually going to be able to start the, the first game of the season. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's th that was probably delayed a little bit based on that. I mean, the competition for CJ at that point was the early enrolled uh, Kyle McCord, uh, Jack Miller, and the recently on campus Quinn Ewer. So it's not like there was a, um, a, a, a lot of question marks, I don't think, at that time. This, it's not the same. Yeah. Right. And, and again, CJ was unable to throw the ball and ended up having to miss a game three weeks into the season because his shoulder was still banged up. So I do wonder if there was something that was physically keeping Ryan from feeling like he could all the way dive into that earlier in camp because it would have been beneficial for cj it would have been beneficial for the program it would have been beneficial even for the the guys who were backing him up to know like this is the role i have to prepare for now and i think it will be beneficial for ohio state this year to know exactly who the starter is as soon as possible do you guys think there's any chance that we walk into the stadium in bloomington not knowing no. who the quarterback is it's just I just don't see that as Ryan Day's mo uh, and the way yeah. he wants to handle things. I mean, uh, it, if Jim Harbaugh's done it a few years in a row, I understand. You know, they when they had those question marks, I just don't think that that is in the best interest of the football team. I think but that I could be wrong. There's a couple other factors uh, other than just simply saying no. One is that Ryan Day played quarterback, and I think that he would have uh, despised being jerked around, which is kind of what you're doing at that point if you're not letting one prepare of the other. The only time that I have ever seen that go into practice at Ohio State uh, was with Cardale Jones and JT Barrett, and both of those guys have been around the program a long time and will have probably also made their feelings known to the coaching staff that that uh, was detrimental to their mental state, and um, <laughs> they didn't like it. And you can't always base that on the players of the, the emotions, the way the players feel. But I think that Ryan Day's experience in that position specifically means that he is much more likely to protect them and put them in the best positions to succeed by September 2nd. It's also different yeah. because you're opening up the season on the road in the Big Ten as opposed to at home with an in-state you know, directional school or something like that. Like I, I feel like... The fact that you are going on, on the road in the Big Ten, it's almost certainly going to be a night game because that's just the way things go against Ohio State. Like you're going to want to have some some real like confidence and, and established mindset. That's of also how, why how, it made it approach that game. ludicrous to go on the road and play Virginia Tech and not be like, uh, okay, now you're in Cardale, right before <laughs> going out there. Like, what was it? Right at, after a national championship, I mean, that was uh, covering that peculiar. whole thing was a circus to begin with, and then they made it even more bizarre at the very end. But oh, and they weren't done, by the way. Yeah, that got even weirder after that. <laughs> yeah, got, you could argue, yeah, it got it was what worse after the fact. Yeah, anyway, imagine. all right. So <laughs> I will have several more months to talk about the quarterbacks. What I like, Bill, about the way that you do your depth charts is that you don't take the or cop out, which you did not do at running back. Hmm. <laughs> I really wanted to. <laughs> it was it was it was hard not to because of, on what I think I wrote this like it's it's sort of the nature of the position right it's especially here like more than one guy is going to play and I would imagine that Mayan Williams and Trevion Henderson will probably have somewhat of an equal share of of the carries or, or a similar share of the carries and whatever goes to the other guys goes to the other guys but uh, it was difficult like I only because I know how good. Dallin Hayden was and can be and like how good Chip Trainum can be. It's like it feels weird not putting these guys on a two deep. But if I'm limiting myself to just two spots, I'm not doing the or thing, then I end up not listing two guys that I think can probably start at every other program in the Big Ten or, or probably around the country. So um I don't know. I didn't I didn't feel tremendously confident um kind of projecting that one out, but I do think like all things being equal, it's still it's still kind of hard to envision a world where Mayan Williams and Trevion Henderson aren't their two leading backs. Is is there a a part of you that thinks it makes sense to put the the first string as Mayan Williams slash Trevion Henderson <laughs> and then the second team as Dallin Hayden slash Chip Trainum? Yeah, I mean, I th I, I consider not really or that. not really yeah. or, but these both of them. I mean, it seems like that would be the the more 
accurate like approach. Yeah, I think uh, in the name of like uniformity, I didn't do that. But I think in actuality, you are correct that it'll probably be more like that. I don't think there is a starter. It's just you, you're you going to play the guy that's healthiest that day and maybe fits the, the defense that you're playing against the best uh, as opposed to. Don't do that, like, Coach Deke Berm. Somebody's got to take the first snap. And they're the starter. Hmm. <laughs> Sure. The first guy who takes the snaps is a starter, but I don't think it's going to be like a pre-established every week in, week out. You're our guy. You're the first guy out there. I just I don't think that's when you have a group of, of guys like this and then you still have the at least the potential to figure out a way to to rotate Evan Pryor into that mix, like in some form or fashion in the offense. I, I think you just have to say who fits the, the style of play we're looking for this week the best. And, and last year was that. also a really good example of why that depth is important because Ohio State needed it to get through the year. Uh, you take a pounding at running back when you go through a Big Ten schedule. And, uh, you know, Travion Henderson plays with such abandon. There's probably going to be times physically that he's going to need uh, a break or some help. And uh, Mayan Williams has had just a string of bad luck. Um, not trying to speak any of this into existence for either one. Uh, I wouldn't wish any ill uh, health for anybody. But you have to think about that, and I think that's probably why when you are in that room, you don't hear a ton about unhappiness or or needing to be fed or uh, spreading around the ball with four guys. Like I think they all know that it's in their best interest if they can collaboratively work together and share that workload to stay healthy, to get healthy and stay healthy uh, throughout the course of a season. Like that, I think it will take all four of those, or will take four or five guys to get through the year. And to avoid yeah, had, yard markers. Like I said, yeah, it's a bad luck. That, like for my, <laughs> had, like you're not just saying he's an injury prone guy. It's just like freaky things are happening to him. That yard marker thing was weird. I forgot about that. Um, I, I think they're going to run the ball more too this year than they did last year. I think it's going to look now. It won't look exactly like 2019 because Justin Fields was involved in carrying that that workload as a rusher, and whoever this quarterback is, I, I don't think will be nearly that prolific of a rusher. But um, I just think because of the line situation and the new quarterback, especially early on, they're going to really rely on that running game. So I think there'll be more opportunities to go around, even if everybody is healthy. Like they had three guys get 100 carries last year. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's conceivable that they can get close to four guys with that many carries if they run the ball as much as I think they're going to this year. Well, how many carries did Jack K have in 2019? I mean, he ran for 2,000 yards. So <laughs> it million. was one guy one guy carrying the rock the entire time pretty much. But I think he had like 320 carries or something like that. So Yeah, and then like by the end of the year, he couldn't run. So yeah, maybe, I thought it, <laughs> maybe they shouldn't do I that. I thought it was approaching for, like 300 for the carries sure. for him that year. Maybe I'm missing 301. Yeah. 301. Um, plus he – they actually yeah. – it would have been 350 if he well, could have and they, finished that Clemson They threw him the ball a decent amount, like more than we've seen with the last couple of years with Ohio State and running backs, right? So tack, tack that on and, and cheat. That's mm -hmm. that's more uh, you know, more exposure to health concerns and risk. And then it, it caught up with uh, JK, of course, as we know, out in Phoenix. Burn, do you know that Burm used to live there? I don't know. That's, that's a different story. <laughs> Lovely Love climate. Wonderful. It wasn't one that of, one of the best. Wasn't that week Some of my favorite way. ecosystems? No, we found a way to bring rain and cold. So I thought it was really brave of you to put Marvin Harrison on top of this depth chart. <laughs> <laughs> I it was it was a nice reprieve to get the receiver and have to not think at all. Um, it just seems very clear cut to me. I don't if if I, so. It was Marvin Harrison Jr. and Mecca Abuka, Julian Fleming, Carnell Tate, Xavier Johnson. Jaden Ballard sort of going like uh, X and slot and Z. And I don't, if you had a, I, I don't know what else you would suggest. <laughs> so I, I don't like the second year receivers. As we talked about them a lot going into the spring, just like, I don't know, didn't really make that push you were talking about. And I guess maybe the, the X factor that I did mention is like Brandon Innes, like what happens when he gets here. But aside from that, I don't, I don't really see it being differently than I projected it to be. Yeah, I think Brandon Innes' opportunity to impact Ohio State this year certainly changes a little bit because you have Xavier Johnson returning. But I think that if 
if you're looking for a guy that could sneak in and find a role on like special teams and kick and punt return, I think Brandon Ennis is a is a guy to watch maybe in that role. I know Ohio State traditionally wants to put someone back there they trust seriously with the football, and Brandon will have to prove that he's that guy. But I think if he does that when he gets on campus, and he'll actually be arriving full time, I think like three weeks from now, so he's going to at least have some opportunity to catch catch the ball, you know, with with other players in, in the indoor for a couple months before practice starts. So he'll be there like a month and a, a month before most of the other guys, but um, there's an opportunity there, but it's going to be hard for anyone else to crack that top six. I think Yeah, on, I think on the, the only thing I'm not sure about uh, as, as Brian Hartline and Ryan day manage that group is like how much work do the top three get and how much that rotation actually exists this year. We've seen them play six and be successful with that. It's not, they definitely have the personnel to do so if they want to. I, if it were me, and I had Marvin Harrison Jr. I would never want to take him off the field, and that's well. I would not put him Except out for two punt returns. That is correct, Brim. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't because I want to play him on every offensive snap. If I want to maximize, you know, my ability to score, pretty much whenever I want. That's just what I would do. And so I, I'm not Ryan Day or Brian Hartline, and I'm curious how much um, that will tempt them. Uh, whether they're comfortable going back to that six. Um, how much gap they see maybe between take Marvin Harrison out of it. Um, you know, how much difference is there between a Mecca, uh, Julian Fleming, Jaden Ballard, Carnell Tate, like how do they see that as they make their list of weapons, the guys that have to be on the field? Cause I, I, I really don't know the answer to that right now. It was hard to get a gauge of that, at least as the current iteration of the team, because of Mecca, Julian and Xavier were limited for, mo- for most of camp for Xavier and all of it. Uh, for the other two. Yeah, that has to be a part of it too, though. I mean, we expect Julian Fleming and Emeka Buka to be back and healthy after getting some stuff cleaned up, um, you know, right after the season ended. But with Xavier Johnson's injury, even though we're being told it's he's going to be fine by the start of camp, you don't know how long something lingers or if something else, you know, if you have a setback. So you have to take those things into consideration. But if you're just looking at August 1, like – it seems pretty cut and dried, in my opinion, who those six are. And I think yeah, Bill Xavier, nailed it. Xavier told me that he hey, would thanks, be cleared man. for uh, full activity by June. Uh, that would give plenty of run up for him until training camp. But as you said, like, again, nothing is ever guaranteed with injuries like that. You're going to come back and uh, not have pads on for two more months after that. Could be a good thing. Could could still take him some time. And we've seen Ohio State be careful with those injuries, uh, types of injuries in the past. You know, be limited, be on a snap count throughout August. We'll see how they manage that. That's a conversation for later on. Um, how much time do we have here to do the offensive line? <laughs> oh, just tight end. Tight oh, end. Tight end. Tight end huh? Wow. I thought this was the year. No, we're not going to talk about the, the tight year. end. Okay, Dang we it. can. I don't think, oh, I just, maybe it was too obvious. Uh, Cade Silver's still here. And Joe Royer is the, is the number two, but maybe there is more to it. But yeah, I don't, I, I, I think thought it was obvious, capacity. and then on Twitter, on Twitter, people are like, "Why is Kate Stover the number one?" I was like, "What do you?" What that was a re- <laughs> why is he the that was one? a real question. He you was got? our starting tight end all of last year. <laughs> yeah, like I like I get he didn't play particularly well toward the end of the year. Um, he was who hurt, do they think was going to be the number um, one? I don't know. Like, I think uh, I think it was just uh, they took exception with with the certainty that Cade was going to be number one. It wasn't necessarily like that they and and when I say they, it was like two people. So I realize they don't speak for the entire fan base, but I just found that response a little interesting. Um, maybe they feel like it should be more opened up to I don't know whoever rises to the top of that depth chart. But Cade Stover is going to be the tight end one. Yeah, he's going to be I the one that rises to the top of the depth chart. So that's the yeah. way it goes. But I mean, there is some complexity behind what Ryan Day talked about with maybe playing some 13 personnel and how much how much you actually use a third tight end. And if you do, does it make more sense for someone like Bennett Christian to be the third tight end because he's a bigger body like they used to use Jake Hausman in the red zone instead of, instead of using a guy like G. Scott, he's more of a pass catcher. Or I mean, I think there are some questions that you could you know come up with there, but as far as who the two that are going to be out there the most, it's it, it's certainly going to be Cade and, and uh, Joe Royer provided their See, both I healthy. thought that was easy. You didn't have to do it. But I just just now thought about Bennett Christian in the Jake Houseman role, and maybe he's the well, guy Bill, that makes the most sense there. You weren't thinking about that before. Don't tell yeah, me. Bill, I mean, Bill and I had talked lie. about 13 personnel in previous uh, episodes, and we all uh, – last week, I guess, specifically. And we also – 
had one day we had a realization just like you did where we're like oh sam hart was playing in the backfield like a fullback like we forgot about that possibility somehow even though i talked about it all spring long and then not once we actually saw <laughs> a sign of it happening i today is a perfect example like the tight ends just can slip out of your mind like that and it happens to the ohio state coaching staff too <laughs> Let me know how soon after this airs on Wednesday morning that you get a text message from one K Bailey saying, don't forget my guys, because I know that in former years, we'd get a text message from one K Wilson fairly quickly. So we're going to, we're going to see how long it, how long it takes. I think it's one of my, one of my favorite, one of my favorite instances ever of a coach like reaching out that way it was Kevin Wilson. After I wrote that story, I think it was two springs ago or last spring about how they should just play with four receivers all the time. He just texted me and said, great story should really help us recruit tight ends. It was last year, right before the coaches clinic, because then the, because then the whole time I just yeah, kept walking over right, to Kevin yeah. and be like, Hey, let's, can we go talk to bill about using some 12 personnel or what? I, I'm going to yeah. miss Kevin Wilson's personality. Like, remember pregame when he said that parents of tight ends would come and, and he'd tell them to get there early because if they wanted to see their their kids catch the ball, they threw the ball in warm-ups before the game? <laughs> yeah, uh, we have uh, individual period at 11.15 before a noon game. Make sure you're there and in your seats. What you got? <laughs> Love it. Offensive line seems, uh, <clears throat> seems like we talked about it we a have. lot, haven't we? Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Like guard, the guard position is the guard position. I think the, the maybe the point that about the offensive line that we have not talked a ton about is Jacob James, like reentering the conversation at center at some point this summer, whenever he gets back from his shoulder and, and he's been at practice every time we've been there, like running around doing stuff. Um, like, I don't know how much more we can say about right tackle, uh, but I think that position sort of, fell a little bit out of sight, out of mind, because we're talking so much about right tackle, but I don't know that that's settled. I think it's pretty clear that Carson Hinsman is ahead of Vic Cutler, but I don't know that it's like Carson Hinsman's job to lose once Jacob James comes back. But maybe you guys feel differently. That's kind of, I, I think it's like, a, that's a competition that ramps back up in the summer once all three guys are involved. I agree. And I want to know, though, from your perspective, I know from your rewatch of the game, what did you focus in on Hinsman at all? And what did you really like think about the way that he performed in his first real opportunity uh, at Ohio Stadium? Um, it was a mixed bag. Like, I, I think you can tell pretty clearly that that he's got to continue to improve his play strength. Like, and like he's going up against like Tyler Williams and Mike Hall. And so that's expected. But um, there were quite a few snaps where, where it was clear that he just like couldn't quite match up with those guys and sort of like hand to hand combat and, and move them the way you want a center to move them. But and I think that's probably true of Vic Cutler too. Like I think both those guys really need to embrace the summer weight training program um, to, to get their play strength up. And I don't know what that's like for Jacob James because we didn't get to see him this spring, but it's probably, it's probably a major, not a major area concern, but like an area of emphasis. I don't know about those guys, yeah. especially for Jacob because he's re coming back from a yeah, injured shoulder. I, I don't know about, Right, play strength and and where his technique is because we had really not seen him do a lot of that previously, and then none of it through spring. But I thought, at least in terms of physical upper body development, that Jacob James had taken a pretty significant step forward. Uh, definitely from the compared to the the guy who arrived on campus a couple of years ago, he looked more physically ready to do that. I don't know if he is or isn't. That would be basically impossible for me to say even if i had seen him in spring i don't know that i would be able to really tell uh with a center without you know hearing some of the feedback from uh justin fry and mike salini and, and others there like i know that he's working extremely hard i know that he's spent every day extra days throughout spring break he was still in the woody working and getting in snaps and working out on his own i, I know that he wants it badly and that counts for part of it uh, and then the physical maturity and understanding the system counts for another two or three parts of that. So to to think that they go into summer, Ohio State goes into the summer, and it's got to be either Carson Hinsman or Vic Cutler, I definitely don't think that's the case. I think Jacob James will have a lot uh, of influence on how this shakes out in August. But I also think it's just not ideal to be heading into summer after what you thought or hoped would be a pretty informational spring to, and have forty percent of the line still sure. very much up for grabs, and maybe more than forty percent of the line. Yeah, it's not ideal. Um, 
but I think I I do like that like Carson Hinsman and Vic Cutler got a lot of really good experience this spring. I think that'll be beneficial beneficial for them. But um, I was probably I, I didn't think there'd be clarity at right tackle coming out of spring. I was a little hopeful, and maybe I think on some of Ohio State probably was hopeful too that they could have gotten some at center. But then the Jacob James thing, I think, kind of nullified that anyway. I don't I don't know how you could have. So it's not it's not the best situation. It's probably trying to remember like past years i feel like it's the most unsettled they've been up front like going into the summer since i've been covering the team ah uh, oh boy they had another year they had another year where they had to replace well, four I mean, guys 2021 go ahead bro i'm saying 2021 when you weren't you when they ended up playing four tackles uh that was certainly a confusing off season as far as where they were going you knew they had the pieces you just didn't know where they were going to be putting them and yeah, then th- this yeah. time around, it's like you don't know if they have the pieces or if you have to move your existing pieces. So I think it is a, a touch more unsettled than before, even in, even in years when you had to replace like 2013 or 2014 when you had to replace, you know, four guys. Yeah, that was that line. was the year that I was going for. I couldn't remember if it was 13 or 14, but it was the the title team, right? Like Taylor Decker was the only one coming back with any experience. Uh, that's how long it's been. So it's been that's a more extreme case. That's 80 percent of the line. But, you know. Uh, only by one <laughs> because we're we're such experts at math um, that we bring that into the show. But you know, three NFL guys leaving is that's a huge mountain to climb. Like that to think you could do that, even even if you were recruiting at an extremely high level, which Ohio State was not doing on the offensive line for several years, um, that's still going to be a daunting prospect to replace three NFL caliber starters. Like you're probably not going to be able to do that in just 15 spring practices. And against some really, really talented uh, Ohio State defensive linemen, like that, just that's a huge, uh, huge amount of pressure, and it's not a surprise if you don't meet that moment. I thought um, just to mention one other guy who, who I did have in the two deep projection. I thought George Fitzpatrick had a pretty good spring game. Um, I don't know what the rest of his spring was like. We didn't, we don't talk about him much. Um, I wasn't frankly paying much attention to him when we were out there at practice because I was so fixated on right guard, but like some people had mentioned on the board at Ohio that rivals.com, like, Hey, George Patrick looks like he played pretty well. So I went back and watched a little bit of it. He did. So I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't think he's like someone who thrusts himself into the right tackle battle, but maybe, I don't know, like, like to go back to what we said earlier in the week, I think all options should be on the table and it does seem like George took a bigger step forward maybe than I would have guessed. So perhaps that's another maybe capable body they can throw into that mix. Yeah, physically he looks a lot different than he did a year ago, much like Carson Hinsman does. Um, and you can tell both of those guys really took to heart the offseason weight program. And it doesn't mean they're done by any stretch because they're both in their second year, but and there's an opportunity to keep growing. But we talk a lot about Tegra Shibola in that 2022 class, but those two guys uh, both did a, a really good job of preparing themselves for the moment. And we do not talk about Fitzpatrick enough, as you said, but uh, some of that I think is because it seems like the clear cut question marks are are bigger than him. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anything else? No. Oh, no. Offense. Kicker? No. Kicker? Kicker's on offense. I mean, uh, Ohio State loses a kicker this week with Jake Seibert entering the transfer portal. There's still three scholarship kickers on, on the, I think it's on only the two. roster, aren't yeah. there? Two. Oh, that's right. Jaden Fielding has not been put on scholarship yet. So. Do you think that another one leaves, or do you think they let a battle happen between three kickers? I I don't think you should carry two scholarship kickers in a world where you're already over the number. I guess maybe is is my thought on that. So uh, I don't know what they're gonna do. <sighs> I don't know. I Burm has become obsessed with with field goal kicking. I don't know what happened. <laughs> what about a 15 minute competition? Winner take all. Loser gets the heck. If out you had of attached those stakes to the <laughs> spring game kicking festivities that you wanted, I might have been on board. You know, there's a good chance I would have had you let me ever complete a thought about the kicking competition. Hmm. Oh but wait, instead, are we wrong? Do they only have one kicker on scholarship now? Well, they I think they only the kid from I thought Fielding right? was or, or put on State. scholarship. Oh, wait. yeah, I well, think Parker Fielding and Lewis. I believe yeah, Lewis, I thought Lewis. that Jaden Fielding got a scholarship. I don't think that I don't think I he thought got it was a the kid from Kent I State. I think he's a, a preferred one. Maybe. I guess we need some clarity on the scholarship situation. Kicker. I mean, 
That's I mean, we were told which kicker right, by Parker Fleming a couple weeks ago that there were three, and he didn't specify. But but we know that Cybert was, was definitely one. Parker won. Lewis was one. So unless he was counting Cybert <laughs> as a cornerback, wow. Mm. Well, we're really. <laughs> Who's the third man? We're really nailing this dismount because Berm had to talk about kickers, and now we look like idiots because we don't know the exact scholarship situation at this super important position. Might be. I just like to make sure we don't leave without things being super awkward around here. <laughs> well, I like the shenanigans <laughs> version more than this one where I just now feel like I've not actually done my job to the best of my ability. Oh, I'm sorry. I you didn't did. mean to make you doubt yourself. You know who else should be doubting themselves? The Ohio State kickers. Mm. As they go into this offseason, into the great unknown. This guy's just mad he didn't get a field goal fest on Saturday. And he's taking it out of the I kickers. just want him to make sure he gets all of his thoughts out. I don't want to get in the way of this kick. Look, when you enter a spring game and there are as many field goals made as there are touchdowns by 70-year-olds, <laughs> I think you have a potential <laughs> issue at the position. That's Perfect. What I'm saying. All right. I don't know that we can top that. That feels like a good place to end this offensive breakdown, which took a wild turn into special teams. Um, I'm not... 60-year-olds? How old's Archie? 68. Okay, so I was close. I was close. He's going in the NCAA Ooh. record books for the oldest uh, touchdown in spring game history. Congratulations! He's not in the NCAA record books enough as a two-time Heisman Trophy winner. He needed that touchdown as well. Maybe he should be allowed to kick field goals. I don't know. Uh, I'll leave that up to Berm to decide on a different episode of the podcast daily. <laughs> this is the one for Wednesday in a post-spring camp edition. As we continue that uh, to get ready for the long months ahead, I promise there'll be a lot weirder episodes than this one. Uh, that's Bill and Berm. I'm Austin. We'll talk to you later.